to start again. So as I was saying, guys, um, thank you very much for coming. It means a lot to me. I'm really passionate, always have been really passionate about dogs, but in particular Dobermans. And it's fantastic to see so many of us, where we've got 45 people on here now, that just hopefully can take something from it and um, just basically pick up on some, some of the things that I use. I'm, I'm forever watching other people as well and trying to take on different information from them and, and different things that I see as successful uh, for what they are doing. So what tonight is all about, it's about uh, passing over some of my, my philosophies uh, because if I click on here, you'll see that the name of the business for those that don't know is Con Jones, Welsh Dog Whisperer. Now, just to, I always like to clarify at the beginning, when I first started about 13 years ago, uh, I was all set to be a PE teacher. That's where I got my degree in. And the Dog Whisperer came on TV. So Season Line came on TV. And I was mesmerized by seeing all these different breeds all together and seeing Dobermans and Rottweilers and bigger, powerful breeds. And I think my parents would be first to admit that as much as our Dobermans were loved, there wasn't enough effort put into training and into socializing and none of our dogs were ever just being able to be walked over the park and socialized with others and things like that and i think it almost in my mind you know because dobermans are very strong powerful dogs they're not really these sociable dogs and uh, and then i was sort of mesmerized as, as well as other people now unfortunately for those that knew better at the time caesar milan's techniques actually seemed to send dog training back the years because it's very aversive. It's very much a case of if the dog doesn't do something that you want them to do, if they're doing something that you don't like, then you touch or in a worst case scenario, use your heel to snap them out of it. And whilst he was dealing with a lot of aggressive dogs and, and certainly had some results, the, the reality is that sort of method is completely outdated and it goes down the route then of this whole myth of you need to be the boss you need to be the alpha type rubbish and in reality it studies have shown where, where they've studied dogs living out um on the streets and and in places such as romania and places like that studies have shown that the ones that tended to be followed the most tended to be the most sociable ones not the biggest most powerful one so it's very much a case for me of trying to spread the word of that we can achieve the results by treating them as a family member not as a dog it's a, a member of the family and there really are so many similarities between raising a dog and raising a child and i don't pretend to be the perfect father i don't pretend to be the perfect dog owner i'm always learning and uh i've, I've made plenty of mistakes along the way and my very first doberman uh, was living with my mother-in-law at the time it was my girlfriend's mother because we were childhood sweethearts and the the dog that was living there was my dog but I'd be up there for two days and then I'd be down with my parents for two days and we were back and forth like that and I doted on a terrible whenever I was there and we had an incredibly close bond but I couldn't let her off the lead uh she had separation anxiety anytime I went anywhere she would be howling in the window and every time I would turn up she would be going nuts now I would humanize the situation and say look at how much Yoshi has missed me Oh my God, she's obsessed with me. I tell people, do you know what? I can't even go to the loo without their following. And again, I was humanizing the situation. And one day we, we went out and we went down to a place called uh, Langadog and we wanted to see if she'd swim. It was a place where my mother-in-law had always taken the dogs for their first swim. And when we got there, she saw about 50 sheep and boom, she was gone. Really super friendly dog. I just wanted to play with the sheep. Well, the, the farmer came out with a shotgun and in no uncertain terms made me made me aware that if I don't keep that dog in the lead, he won't hesitate in shooting the dog. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, when I moved into my own home, at the time, Yoshi was still living with my mother-in-law, and I had a new Doberman that came as, as a pup. Now, it only took weeks, and Yoshi moved in with me because she was absolutely doting on me as well. But right from the off then, I, I had been putting in loads of research of how am I making these mistakes? Why is my dog pulling on the lead? Why won't my dog recall? Why will it chase sheep and, and all these sort of things? And that dog actually ended up becoming my obedience demo dog. And some people here will, will have met her. And then from there, my sort of philosophy started to change. And it, it changed from this, I've got to be the boss, to how can I allocate time to actually educate our dog, uh, um, my dogs? And 
that doesn't mean to say that I don't believe at times we're going to need to address a dog's behavior because they are going to make mistakes. But because your children make a mistake, do you, years gone by, they would have had a, a smack and a bum. Well, those days are gone now. And rightly so. And it's the same with the dogs. Do we need to step in and get physical with them? No, we don't. So we're going to educate them. And for everything that we want to teach, if I've got a dog that's constantly barking at the TV or barking at somebody going past, rather than simply go in and every time the dog barks, poke him in the side, let's start. It takes longer. I'll be honest with you. You're not going to get as quick um, results. And that's the whole point is that people will see things on TV and think, wow, look at that. That's a changed dog. No, it's a changed dog because at this moment, it's the first day that it's spending time around the trainer and he's sort of taken in the, the natural instincts to continue doing what they're doing. As soon then as a trainer such as Season Land leaves or when I leave, the dog always reverts back. So it's always down to the owner, which is why we've got to try and help the owner. And it's a long uh, process. It isn't about quick fixes. So if I'm going to stop a dog barking, well, first step, let's teach him or her to bark on command so that we can then teach her to be quiet. And then we can start putting them in scenarios where they learn, now is a good time to bark. Tell you what, you go find one of my children. You bark to tell me and alert me that you found them. Now we're putting that barking into something productive. And then when I say shush, that's where you stop. When I want to sit down and watch TV, don't be jumping up every time somebody passes the window. So I'm going to, I'm going to teach you exactly what to do. And we're going to basically, we're going to spend the next hour just looking at some of the generic information that I feel before I even start working with dogs for a specific one-to-one, -one, this is all the information that I used to talk through every single consultation. And instead, by default from lockdown, I put this webinar together so that we can now hit, as tonight we've hit 50 people, so that if in the event, one or two of you would like to meet up and, and we end up doing a one-to-one, -one, we can get straight into the specific issues that you're having. So. In order to get started, I'm working with, with people as well as the dogs. I spend more time working with the people than I do with the dogs. Uh, I'm, I'm really proud of the way that I've, I've developed and I've been able to foresee something that's going to happen. So I may need to step in and things like that. But generally, it's the owners that I'm, that I'm working with. So in a bid to make it more simplistic to understand, everything that I'm trying to do is about making it simplistic. I looked at the dogs and I thought, right. What am I looking at? Some of you may have seen videos on, on the internet where I've got 40 dogs dropped off to me and they'd spend half the day. Monday to Friday, the place I'm in now, I'm limited down to 20. So, but I get 20 dogs a day. How can I get them together? Because I'm constantly looking for changes in body signals. So in order to look for those changes, the very first thing I looked at was let's split the dog up into different body parts. And there happened to be seven. Okay, no doubt you could, you could go further. But as I said, I'm trying to make it simplistic to understand. So working from the top down, we've got head, ears, eyes, nose, mouth, body, and tail. So those are my seven. Now something in those seven always changes and every action from the dog is gonna create a reaction from me. It may create me a reaction when I reward them, I may ignore them, I may need to step in and address their behavior. And we're going to come on to that. Well, what do you do if my dog is lunging at a dog or trying to attack the postman or, or whatever? Well, yes, we have got to step in and give some sort of guidance. So now that we've got those seven, we need to put those seven in to groups of signals. So again, trying to make it as simplistic as possible. I've got five general ones that I go, right, okay, that's diffusing or that's relaxed. So the very first one that we're going to fly through, play Play signals, most of us are really comfortable in picking up when our dog's trying to play. So here you've got Zeus, a Tibetan Mastiff that was a very, very assertive dog and had his disagreement with dogs. And the same could be said about Ruby, the Bull Mastiff. And these were two that came to me regularly. And you can see here that Ruby's engaging with Zeus. Looking at the seven, which we'll talk about in a bit, they're all relaxed there, which is nice. Ruby invites him to play by jumping away. He acknowledges, so there's got to be an invitation, got to be an acknowledgement from the dog that's being invited or from the person. She carries on off as a paw. Others come to look. Zeus jumps up and says, right, come on, then chase me, and they're away to go. So play signals. We're not going to spend much time looking at them. Which brings us on to diffusing. Now, with diffusing signals, I can spend 
I know we're discussing diffusing signals. There's so many different scenarios. Dogs will use diffusing signals to diffuse tension. Uh, you can get to the stage that you've got perhaps two people having an argument in the house and then the dog starts jumping around, acting a bit of a fool to try and diffuse the tension. Sometimes the dog might start barking because the dog isn't happy with, with the tension in the house at that time. And with the diffusing signals, the, a lot of the time, the times I try to mimic them, A, I'll change my approach if I see them giving me diffusing signals, trying to diffuse tension. But also, often I get, I may get a dog that comes to the center that's scared to interact with other dogs. And when, when they come, they may initially sit in the corner. And then I'd use one of the more calm dogs to approach. And the way they'll approach, they'll go so far and then they'll stop. They may sniff the floor. They may scent and have a wee to, um, to communicate. Okay, look, this is who I am. Trying to get the nose engaged. There's another one coming on. Trying to get the nose engaged. Uh, then often they'll go from looking at the person or, or at the dog, sorry. And from there, they put this sort of dopey smile on where they look and they look away. So they break eye contact. So they go and they look away and then they arc towards the dog. And then that dog may air snap and they'll go, right, okay, too soon, they'll step away. But that's the type of dog that's going to earn the trust. And that's what I mimic by approaching sideways on, by not trying to make a dog that's baring teeth and snarling at me, not going, cut that out, cut that out. Why is the dog snarling at me? Let's try and diffuse the tension. Sometimes a dog will stretch. So when, it, when I stand up and a dog starts barking at me and lunging at me um, on a consultation, I may automatically not even bother looking at the dog and just stretch whilst I let the owner redirect the dog back to their bed and see, look, see, there was, there was nothing to be panicking about. So diffusing signals are important. And I, I had this, this video sent to me by a friend. I said, Carl, you've got to see this. It's on TikTok or something like that. Look at the way he admits it at the end. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to watch the video. Come here. Who did that? Is that you? Who did that? So it looks really cute. Looks like he's, he's admitted it. And he said, right, you know, that was me. But in reality, what we've got to do is look at the beginning. So yeah. we've all been in a position where we've walked in and our puppy has chewed the stairs or chewed the carpet or chewed one of our favorite shoes. And without noticing, you walk in and your reaction would normally be to walk in and be, hey, a boy, and make a fuss of the dog. So the dog gets up to come and say hello. You walk in, all of a sudden you freeze and you, you take in the disaster that is now in front of you. And by changing your body signal like that, your dog looks and goes, oh, I don't like this. They're not thinking, oh my gosh, why didn't I pee underneath the set? So he wouldn't have found it. They are simply saying, right, I don't like your signals at that moment. So if we look at this staffy, he's coming down to greet the person and the person who, the moment he goes and points, who did that? So he comes down happily. Who did that? Who did that? Right. So right from the off, let's stop it there. He's come, normally, I'm assuming he'd get a, a positive Greek then, and he stops, raises his paw. By turning this way, obviously, he's showing his underbelly, which is the, the less protected area. So often when they'll do that, they'll be like, look, I don't want any trouble. So which direction does he then go? Whilst the owner carries on going, who did that? Does he move forward and carry on trying to get a fuss? No, he turns sideways on. Is that you? He steps further. Look at the tongue flick Who there. And then he shows his underbelly again. So he came to greet him. There was tension between him and the owner. So he used diffusing signals to try and diffuse the tension. He made himself smaller. Very simple. If they make themselves bigger and, and intensely staring, obviously they're being more challenging. He's made himself smaller. He averted eye contact. He turned side. He moved backwards, turned sideways. He flicked his tongue and looked away. So... He wasn't admitting it at the end. He was simply saying, right, are we done with this now? Can you calm down? And if the owner instantly turned around by here now and went, right, come on then, he'd have been like, oh, great, great, we're done. And then he'd have just moved on. So those are diffusing signals in a nutshell. Relax signals. Now, these are the ones that we're going to be marking and we're going to talk about market training later on. So this is just a, a, a photo of Malik in one of the classes. Now, First of all, you can see the other dogs, uh, Scooby and Feebo, uh, sniffing the floor. 
You've got uh, St. Bernard now, but there that's just laid down completely relaxed. So the, the vibe around them is obviously really relaxed. But if we look at the, the seven, head is in neutral alignment to the body. It hasn't hunched or it hasn't got up and on, on the alert or fixated on something. It's in neutral alignment. Ears are nice and relaxed, angled backwards in a, in a relaxed manner. Eyes, now these are really important. The eyes are almond shaped, not wide eyed, circular, excited. Oh my gosh, not showing the whites of the eyes where the dog is feeling intimidated. So they show what we call whale eye. So you're always looking for soft, blinking, soft, almond shaped eyes. Nose, dogs are born both blind and deaf, which a lot of you will know better than me because I know that. That are really, really experienced breeders here. That um, you know, I, I'll be coming to you for you to you for advice. But um, nose comes first, then the eyes, then the ears. So then they they can they can see what is it around ten days, here around uh, 17, 18 days. But they can smell from day one. And what we're looking for, any time that they want to engage with other dogs or people or anything, if the nose is working, a dog never sniffs and then attacks. They can, there can be a small window where they can sniff and then all of a sudden freeze and then go. But whilst they're sniffing, they can't attack. So if they're, if they're sniffing, then they're feeling relaxed. That's a, a big sign that we're looking for, such as I said to you with Scooby and Fever. He's not using his nose, but he's not engaging with anybody, so that's fine. Jawline. It's key that the jawline runs back to below the eyes. And this is one that you see pretty um, clearly with our, with our choice of breed with Dobermans. Particularly, just think of when, you're, when your dog is going to be sick, it's broke grass or something, they pull this face with the, the jawline pinches forward. But in the next photo, you're going to see what I mean by the jawline changing. Jawline back to below the eyes. That's always what we're looking for, okay? We can't see the body. We can't see the, the tail. But basically, that's a nice, relaxed dog. And we look at videos at the end to highlight this even more. Cutoff signals. Now, with a cutoff signal, this is really important between cutoff and targeting, okay? So cutoff signals and targeting signals could be uh, baring of teeth, growling, air snapping, lunging, barking. And all of these things are often associated with aggression, particularly when you've got a Doberman. So we will always get the blame. The German Shepherds will always get the blame. The Rottweilers will always get the blame. And when you've got, as I've got, I've got a, a, a Pomeranian, well, a La Pom, and when the little ones are yapping at the bigger ones and then the, eventually the bigger one goes and barks and says, look, will you just leave me alone? You will always get the blame. So we've got to do more than simply look at breed and see teeth. We've got to actually split them up into two, cut off and target them. So a cut off signal means stop doing what you're doing. So you don't correct those. You don't address those, those signals. And if I show you this photo here, I can't tell you enough times. This was just something that was on the internet that, that I that I liked. But this uh, this photo here, oh, there's another one joining. Sorry, there's two more joining in by here. So this baby or this young child has approached the dog. Now I actually ask people when I'm doing a console and stuff if ever I show them this photo. So what would you do here? And they're like, oh, I don't like the, the way the dog is looking at it there. I would probably shout at the dog to, to move away. Now, let's look at it. Head has dropped down out of the neutral alignment. It's now in line with the shoulder. So he's, he's hunched. Ears are pulled back. Eyes. There's that whites of the eyes like I was explaining. So there's the whale eye. He's that close. And even though it's a photo, you can see he's not, he's not engaging with that child or she. He's not sniffing. Jawline, like I mentioned earlier. Jawline should run back to the letter F in the word furrowed. So that would put it there. But you can see it's here above the letter E in the word tense. So he's pinched his mouth forward. No different. If you scare somebody, their eyes will go wide and you will automatically pinch your mouth forward. Don't even notice and you'll go. It's instinctive. So this dog, no doubt, has had the child approach and has gone instantly, tense, tight, close, stiff and body posture. In that scenario, this child could be somebody else's dog a cat, um, a, a, a child, a person, anything. That child has gone in to the dog's space. We never ever address the dog's behavior there. Ideally, you remove the child before she even gets that far. But in this scenario here, whatever the this is here, dog, cat, person, we remove them 
we don't necessarily reward them because we don't want to reward them for becoming tense, but we've got to let them know, don't worry, I got your back. And this is very much what I was talking about. This is the type of scenario where as those signs are shown, an aversive trainer would correct them or check on the lead. Don't look at the child like that. Well, if, if that happens, the child, uh, sorry, the dog misses out these signals and goes straight to an air snap instead. So we've got to know the difference that if something is coming into your dog's space, and we've all been there as well, where you're walking down the beach and then stereotypically, I don't know, spring spaniel, I've got loads of springers that come to me. I absolutely love the breed. But if ever I'm out working with an aggression case that's living with me, I don't know, it tends to be a springer or something comes running over and you've got an owner 40 meters away shouting, oh, it's all right, he's friendly. And then this dog's buckling and I'm trying to catch, I'm only five foot nine and then I've got a massive rotty jumping all over the place. It's, yeah, but mine isn't. So the point is there, the spaniel came into, the, into my personal space. It's not my dog's fault for reacting. It's for them to call their dog back. And that's the difference between knowing if your dog's going out of its way to target or whether your dog is given a cutoff signal because it changes your whole reaction time. So finally then targeting signals. Now with targeting, it's the opposite. That means your dog is trying to go towards something. Now targeting doesn't mean aggression. Your dog may be targeting something to attack. Your dog may be targeting something because they want to jump all over who's just walked in the front door. They may be in a territorial state that's targeting the front door to chase away the postman. Or it, like in this example, this was um, a consultation that, that I did with somebody that owned a Doberman. And the problem that she was getting is that her Doberman wouldn't settle in the garden during lockdown, but it was lovely and sunny. Every two seconds, her dog is up, pacing around the lovely big garden and barking at a sound. So they can target with sight. They can target that they feared something. They can even target a smell. So if we just watch this video, you can see the dog <laughs> is targeting something around the outside. This is pretty typical of what he does for 80% of his time in the garden. He thinks he's heard somebody in the lane that runs behind this wall. So he'll run around manically like this. So, so that's just a quick example of, of a dog that's targeting something. Now, if, if our dogs are targeting, these are the ones out of the five groups of signals I've, I've just mentioned. These are the ones that we may need to step in and give some guidance. But before I can ex explain how to give the guidance, we need to look at the science behind dog training. So there are five methods that I want to talk about that, that, that we need to consider. Fear-based training. So this is very much, as I've talked about, aversive training, correct your dog, and make sure that they realize if you do that again, you're going to get a correction. Personally, I put that in a bit. Uh, I want to build a relationship through trust, not through any rubbish about me being the dominant one. Then you've got free shaping. Now, with free shaping, uh, you, you won't do as much of this, but free shaping means that your dog has decided to do something. You haven't asked them to do it, and you like it. So uh, all you're thinking about at the moment is you don't want them crossing the front door. And they get to the front door, and they sit. You wouldn't think and sit, but you like it, so you mark it. But these are the three we're going to consider most at the moment. Fixed shaping, luring, and lead guidance. So fixed shaping is when you've got something in your mind, and you're going to shape them to do that. So in the example of sending them to their bed, asking them to switch off, if we send them to their bed, I shape it by giving them the direction, first of all, and that's where luring comes in and lead guidance. But as they're in there, I'm going to mark, and I'll talk about marking in a moment when I use my clicker. I mark if they sit, I mark if they lay down, and then I mark if they tilt their rear on the side. So I've shaped them. My goal was to get them lying down tilted, but I marked them along the way to let them know good, good, better, that sort of one. As they get better, I don't mark the first, I don't mark the second, I only mark the last one. Now, luring, we've all lured. Uh, we've all used treats to put them into a sit, into a down, into a stand, uh, and different things like that. And with that, then, it's really important to use luring because we're using something, a primary reinforcer, something that they that they need to make, give them the uh, direction that they to get them to do something for us. The problem with luring is that 
it's hard to take it away. So I'll give you the example, your dog's at the garden, all of a sudden stops coming in when cold. So you rattle a tin of treats and they come running in. Before you know it, every single time you want to get the dog in, you've got to rattle a tin full of treats in order to get the dog in. So it's, it's finding the right times. Anytime I introduce something, I will lure into all these different things, into a heel, into a flip, into legs and all these things. But we've got to try and wean it out. And then finally, you've got lead guidance. Now with lead guidance, this is where you're going to add a little bit of pressure. They don't want to go to their bed. So you're going to put a little bit of pressure on and you're going to guide them to the bed and then they get off and then you catch the lead and you guide them back and then they get off and you're going to keep doing it. And then all of a sudden they sit and then you're going to go bingo and you're going to mark and treat. And there are going to be times you're going to need lead guidance. You may be guiding them into a heel. You may have a dog that lunges across on another dog. So you've got to take hold of the lead and you've got to guide them back. But it's not about checking them back. It's about guiding them and getting them to try again. So we're going to go in and out of these in different scenarios and different, different environments that we're working in. So this is the longest video I'm going to ask you to watch, okay? This is a, a Doberman that came to stay with me as, uh, as a puppy over, uh, over lockdown. And the owner was experienced a lot of problems, but the main thing was that they just couldn't get the dog to settle on the settee with them. The only time the dog ever slept was in a crate. And then when it came in the settee, just wanted to mouth and grab and do all this young puppy behavior. But they said, look, we want to give her the run of the house. We wanted to come and have a cutch in the bed. We wanted to have a cutch on the settee, but they couldn't get it to settle. And you're going to see me trying and you're going to see me failing, but gradually marking at the right time. You're going to see me here try to shape her at the worst possible time into a more relaxed state. But before I can show you the video, the final thing to talk about is market training. Now, Different trainers use different markers. And I've got four that we need to consider, okay? I've got a preparation marker. So this is when I want them to do something. So Lilo in particular, I will go, I'll bring it to me and I'll say Lilo, and then I'll say Ishta and I'll sit her down. And then I'll go and hide my keys out in the field. And then I'll go, Barad, so I'll ask her, are you ready? And she will automatically go and look at me. And she's like, right, we're ready to go. And then I'll go find the keys. So that one's more important when you're setting up an activity. It's the next three that I use on a daily basis. So I've got a positive marker, which is my clicker. You don't have to use a clicker. Some people like to use the word good or yes. I use yes as well if I haven't got the clicker. Now, the positive marker is also my continuation mark. Some refer to it as continuation. Some refer to it as duration. Basically, it sounds complicated, but my clicker means you've just done something right and I need you to continue doing whatever I just marked. So if you're on your bed and I click you, okay, don't overthink it. If I clicked you for sitting, it doesn't mean you've got to stay sitting because I didn't give the command to sit. The only thing I said was go to your bed, but you've stayed on your bed. By all means, make yourself comfortable. But I'm going to use my clicker for that. I'm going to mark. And then when they get off, they take the treat and they get off. No, you lead them back to that. Me saying no, that brings us on to the next one, which is a negative marker. With the negative marker, I've got two. I've got, if they're about to do something wrong, I try to let them work out themselves. But if I can see, I'm going to drop uh, some chicken on the floor and I'm teaching them impulse control and I can see they're about to lunge at it. If I go, ah, there's my negative marker. I mark the fact that they became engaged. They went to move and I go, ah. And if they look at the chicken and then look at me, I will then use my positive marker to go, bingo, great decision. Then I'll go and pick the chicken up and then I'll drop different things. So I'm teaching them, that impulse control then to not go shooting over there. So I use a negative marker. If they shoot over there, I've already lost them. So now I've got to take hold, lead them back. And I'll say, no, nope, and then I'll lead them back. And no to me means try again. Okay, we'll do it eight times, we'll do it nine times. We're going to keep doing it and I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to get frustrated. I'm just going to keep setting up the scenario until you make the right choice through trial and error. And then I'm going to mark you with my positive marker. And then finally, I've got my release marker. And with the release marker, I say free, so free. And you can use that to speed up your training. So I may say sit. And as they sit, I go sit, free. And they run to me to get the treat. If I use my clicker, I go to them. If I use free, they come to me. I may say uh, sit, click treat. Now click with me. I don't even bother saying stay. Click means stay anyway. So click, I walk away 20 meters. And then I go down. And when they drop into a down, in order to speed that down, because you get some dogs go like this, one, two, some dogs. 
slowly drop into the down. I want to speed it up. So instead of then clicking and walking all the way back to them, <clears throat> excuse me, which is quite boring, I'll say, sit. And then I go down. And as they go down, I'll shout, free. And I'll launch the ball 40 meters that way. And they go, Phew. they bring it back to me. I take them over, sit, come away, down, boom. They drop, free. And I launch the ball. So I use free to A, release them from whatever they've done. It's telling them you've done it right. It may be something like releasing them off their beds. but it can be something if I've given a specific command, down, free, launch the ball, they go shooting off. So I keep using all of those markers and you're gonna use, see me here, use my positive marker, my calming marker, the clicker, to get a dog that's mouthing and, get, and, and she jumps up and you're gonna see how with perseverance you can get there. Right, we're gonna have a little look here at teaching your dog to switch off on command. For me, it's the most important thing that I've ever taught any of my dogs. I, I stumbled upon the importance of this because I had five Dobermans and my children were three, two, and one. So for me, if every time I got my hands on my knees to play with my children, the dogs were trying to get involved, it wouldn't have been a safe environment. As good as they were with the children, it just wouldn't have been a safe environment. So I allocated set times that were dog time so they knew that, that they had my full attention. And in between that, they were asked to go to a set place and switch off. Now this has got, went a long way to preventing issues such as separation anxiety because they weren't following me around the whole time that I was home. Hyper excitement when somebody comes to the doorway because I wasn't allowing them to meet anybody until I felt they were calm enough. And some people come to the house that are scared of dogs, allergic to dogs, dressed to the nines because they're off to a wedding and the last thing they want is dogs coming over to them. So it was really important for me to teach my dogs to go to a set place. And like I said, some people are scared of dogs. So I've had children coming around with, uh, with my children that didn't want to enter the house because they knew I had five big dogs. But then once they came in and they saw that the dogs weren't moving and they were nice and relaxed, they gradually grew to love my dogs. And it's, it's just been an incredibly important tool in all of my training. So we're going to have a look at a dog that a friend of mine has allowed, uh, allowed me to use for this. I've been working with her for a week because she's an extremely boisterous five month old puppy Doberman. And she's been to the center with me today, like she does every day up to dinner time. So she comes home, she has her food, she has a sleep. And now's the time that we would be going for a walk. So you're going to see the challenge that I'm going to have in trying to get her to switch off. Now at home, uh, her owner has already told me she'll never settle, no matter how much she's taken out or stimulated, she won't settle in the house. The only time she'll settle is if, she, if she's put in a crate. But they're quite happy to have it up on the settee. She won't settle there. She's constantly up and down, up and down, up and down. And this has proven the case with me. So it, it's it's a work in progress. Now I've waited for a time and she's literally by here pulling the top through on the top of the crate, getting herself really wound up. So I'm gonna let it out and you're gonna see how I'm gonna use the marker. Now with the marker, I've got three stages. Stage one is if she's sitting. Stage two is if she's lying down. And stage three is if when she's laying down, she's tilted on her side. Now, when I, when I mark each stage, the key for me is to disengage from them because this is where we've got to talk about motivators. And when I speak to people about motivators, they say, uh, well, if I ask them, tell me something you can use to motivate your dog to do something you want them to do. And I'll get them saying food, which is true. What else? Um, ball, my dog loves a ball. Great, what else? And this is where they're stumped. What they don't realize is eye contact, sound, body language, touch. These are all these are all motivators. So done at the right time, you, you're going to motivate the right behavior. But use at the wrong time, you're going to motivate the wrong behavior. So you've always got to ask yourself, what's the lesson? The lesson here is, look, I want you to just relax. Now, she's, I know full well she's not going to fully relax and just go to sleep. Because other than just being put out to the loo, she's already been sleeping for the last three hours. So I know this is going to be a challenge, but I just want you to see at a more difficult time for her, how I prevent her. If she gets up, I move her back. I don't, I don't get frustrated with her. Certainly never lose my temper, but I'm relentlessly consistent. And as she progresses through the stages, I'm going to mark reward. I've got a little bit of leftover mozzarella cheese from the food I've been cooking. And then I'm going to disengage from it. So let's see how she does. So, here she is. 
come over, straight away a little bit excitable, fine. It's expected. She's five months old. She's been sleeping for three hours. So ideally she'd go for a walk now. But So there she's nearly she's trying to get up the cheese so I can have moved up for a second. So she's pushing. I'm gonna disengage. I'm gonna block her. I'm gonna wait. She is laid down, but she's still trying to steal. So I need there. Why she stopped. And from there, I'm gonna disengage from her. So this is when I turn the TV on or something like that. Now once she's moving, there she gets up. I'm just gonna block, wait. And once she's up, down, up, down, I'm gonna completely ignore it. Now I'm just holding a collar, for example, for a second to prevent her movements. Let me move into that. Let me move this pillow. Right, that was quieter. There's the mark. And now she's gone from stage three, which was lying down tilted. There, so she's up. There's me. Come here, please. <laughs> Try to play games. Play bow. Consistent. Back up. Now, sit down. Watch your leg. And then, now I'm not going to mark that at the moment. Because I'd already got her to the stage where she switched off for a split second and laid down. Now she needs to show me that she's there for a little bit longer. So stopping her from falling off the bed. There, and she stopped. Disengage from her. And now I'm going to come in with a, a gentle touch to try and accelerate the relaxation. And this is the longer she's been settled this time. So I'm going to mark that. And she's slowly working it out that if she clutches down, And now instead of having a boisterous dog, she's slowly switching off. She's still engaged because she's, she's, she's kissing me. She's moving. Her eyes are quite wide open. First opportunity she gets is she's going to get jump up and she's going to run away. But that's okay. That's all part of the process. As she gets better, she's going to relax a lot faster. But as I said, the, you, you've got to make sure that you provide mental and physical stimulation first anyway. And take away distractions. I move the pillows and... That she, she needs the mental and physical stimulation now because this is when she'd have another walk with me. So it's a very difficult time for her to be expected to settle down, but I wanted to show you that it can be achieved by marking at the right time and being calm and consistent. So, should we go on a walk then? Come on in. So, um, as I said, that's the longest video I'm going to ask you to, to look at. But as I said, I genuinely believe that this is the most important thing I've ever taught any of my dogs. And I stumbled upon the importance of it because uh, I, when my children were young, when I had five Dobermans and my children were three, two, and one, and if every time I tried to play with my children, they were trying to get involved, it wouldn't have been a safe environment. So there were times that I allocated to dog time. There were times I allocated to children time. And then there were times that as much as possible I allocated to complete family time where we were exercising together, we were playing games and then cutting down it during the evenings. And you saw me using my marker. And the purpose of that then is to wean out the marker. Now, some people will, will still keep clicking, but they'll reduce the amount of treats. I don't. My opinion is if I click, I give a treat. I just click a lot less. And the aim is to is to create switched off dogs. So I've mentioned here about market training, teaching a dog to switch off. And if, uh, so if I forward to here first, we'll come back to that, sorry. this, And that is an example of the 
two dogs are on their beds, but then the pom happened to come up in the set. They, they, they alternate. People often ask me, does it have to be the same place every time? Generally, when my dogs come in the living room, unless I put blankets down, because we've got fabric settees now, uh, they tend to either go on the bed or I put a blanket down, they come for a cut up up on top. Um, the pom gets a little bit more freedom in the living room. The dining room is the, the dogs, which is where we spend a lot of our evenings, and they've got their own leather settees, so they go up on there. And it, it all depends on, on where I am uh, in, in the house. We just, if I allocate them there, so as I say, sometimes they come up on the, on the, on the settee there, but that's what we're looking at with a, with a switched off dog. Now, going back, correction. So should we ever correct our dog? As I've said, there's going to be times you're going to need to step in. You're going to need to address their behavior. And if I feel the need to step in, I always say you have to fulfill the two Ds of addressing, okay? Distract and then direct. Now, I've seen many programs with trainers on and some will, uh, well, there's, there's a protection firm not far from me that the first thing you've got to do when you go there is buy a thick chalk chain and a big, thick lead. And then it's very much, as I've said, about physically correct that dog. If the dog moves off the bed, throw the lead at them. And honestly, I've had, I don't know, maybe 30 people telling me that same story and then there's all different things. But the, the point is the distraction if you catch them earlier enough, the aim is to use sound and body language. So that's what I talked to you about, a negative marker. If they go to do the wrong thing, then I'll go, ah, and I'll catch them. But that's only the distraction. You've got to then follow through with direction. So sometimes I'll let them work it out and, and decide to move away. Lovely, good job. But other times, if they go to do something, I don't know, the, there's a knock on the door and they jump up barking and I'll say, right, thanks, guys back on your bed and I'll direct them back to their bed. Hence why the bed becomes so important. Be, have, having a, a safe haven that I can send them to, I never struggle with separation anxiety anymore. Uh, I never have a problem with being territorial at the doorway. I never have a problem with bringing people in that are scared of dogs because if my dogs have been asked to go to their bed, they don't, they don't move off the bed. So it's about giving them some direction at certain times. And if I'm dealing with a dog that is up on the lead, lunging or is completely ignoring you, you can go at till you're blue in the face. You've already lost them. So then the distraction needs to become touch. And by touch, I don't mean physically correct. I mean, leave a lead on. Set the, the, the scenario up where you can then take hold of the lead and guide them back and basically go try again. And you've got to be consistent. And nobody's more consistent than me. I'm relentlessly consistent, but it's about leaving emotion out of the way and not getting frustrated, not getting angry. If you feel yourself getting frustrated, Put them out uh, or put them in a crate. If you use a crate, put them in the garden, let them go to the toilet, have a cup of tea, get ready, re-energize, start again. And just make sure that they realize, look, Dobermans will be extremely willful dogs. And there are loads of dogs that are the same. So we've just got to make sure that we are consistent to the point that they realize, well, I may as well just do this now because as boring as it is for me to just go on the bed because I want to go and see who's coming in. I have been told to, and if I do the right thing, I'll get a click and a treat out of it. So, as I said, that's a switched off dogs. And what I'm going to do here, if I stop sharing for a second, I'm just going to show you an example then. So, of how the aim is to them, once they know the exercise, the aim is to wean out the marker. So, the problem with continuing to keep marking is that the moment you bring food into it is a motivator that's going to inadvertently switch them on so i'm going to use it to mark sit in lying down tilt in but very quickly i'm going to wean out the first two and then i'm going to expect more from them so you're going to see me bring lilo and stitch in now i've just put a rug down because stitch unfortunately may need spinal surgery so he had seemed to have had a an accident a weekend last weekend where he yelped out when we were out on a walk and he couldn't walk for a couple of days he's responded really well to the steroids but i put a rug down, he's walking, he's doing great on the stairs, but we're still not, we're still not sure. It looks very similar to wobblers, which some, some people here have probably um, experienced themselves. So you'll just see it. I'll bring them in, send them to their bed, and then I, I'll instantly disengage away from them. So I'm not going to click and treat because that's going to keep them switched on. Once they know the activity, you just wean the marker out. So I'll be two seconds. Good. 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 Good.
So you can already see there, I don't know if you can see stitches pause are slightly off the bed. But there. So that's him just pushing a little bit too excitable. He tends to do that. Now he starts suckling on the side because he wants to get up. So I'm just gonna stitch, you know. And from there, I disengage straight away. And if they get up, I don't get frustrated. I've walked away from them here. They are settled on the bed. If they get up, then I'll send them straight back. Uh, but they'll just simply, you can see Lilo now is making herself comfy because she's understanding, right? I may as well settle down. And that's the start, switching them off. And that brings us on to then uh, impulse control. So we're nearly towards the end. And what I'm going to take this opportunity to do, if you've got questions, normally when I've got um, a group of 10 or 20, then we can have a little chat at the end. When we've got a, a group as large as this, if you've got a question, we're not going to be able to go through them all because we'll be here till 11 o'clock tonight. But in the chat section, if you've got anything, what I ask is that it's more specific to this because the first time I did it, I had people asking loads of questions about the individual issues they were having. And there may be 44 people here that aren't really that interested in the issue that you're having there. And as I said, that's where we need to be speaking individually. But more uh, to the point, if you've got any questions about what I'm covering tonight, Please, if you put it in the chat section, then I'll check it at the end when, when we finish. And then um, I'll see, I'll, I'll try and answer a, a few of them as well then. So back to here, this brings us on to switching off during play time, okay? So it's very important to teach them to switch off at home, but then you start moving it to the big wide world and we look at impulse control in a minute. So we've had our morning game of fetch. Every day we do the same. I've got the balls of all three of them. They're still excited. Look how excited they are. They're going to, Lilo in particular, got a massive drive for the ball. I'll be going out later on to put that drive into something else, doing a bit of search and work with the children. But every day then, they still haven't been to the toilet. So they come out, they've got a wee, but I know that they need to go to the toilet. So I don't hide it away. I want them to understand, game over. So you've got a definite sign when I do this with my hands. So I'll walk over. I tend to put it by the, by the dog bin. The temptation's there. Game over. See how they move. They're ready to go to the toilet. So that's being able to have something there as the temptation. And this is how we get to the point that they don't go running over to steal other dogs' balls and go chase a football that people are playing football with. Because we teach them all of those scenarios, but we teach them what they should do. So again, when I what I did there, I say game over, and I put the balls on the floor. I didn't hide them away. Every single one of my dogs has tried to rob the ball the moment it's gone on the floor. But then I've gone, ah, and they've stopped, and I just wait. And when they step away, I go collect treat. And just with a little bit of consistency, you wean that out. And, well, as you saw there, I went game over. But they're not perfect, because if you actually look closely, keep your eye on the Pomeranian. I think because the dogs get to the ball so before him all the time. Do this with my hands. So I walk over, I tend to put it by the, by the dog bin. So there's the dogs. There's Lilo and Stitch. I put the ball down, game over. They do what they the should do. There. Game over. Off they go. See There's the move. Pomeranian. They're ready to go to the toilet. Nips in and grabs the ball. And I didn't even know until I looked at the video later on. So they're still going to make mistakes. I think he just thought, right, the hell with you two. You've had and the ball for the last 20 know, minutes. I'm robbing that now. So bring this on to impulse control. The point of the matter is this. I always use the analogy of climbing Everest. In order to reach a summit, You've got to start at base camp. If you can't do what I've done there and just send them to the bed, get them to settle down, get up, move around the room, leave the room, nip to the loo without having an audience, go out and make yourself a cup of tea without them constantly following you. And I've, I often see on the forums, I see uh, a typical one, it'll be a meme of a Doberman and he'll be pushing his head in through the bathroom door and he'll say, thank God I found you. I haven't been able to find you for the last two minutes. And then we'll champion that side of our breed and we'll all go, oh, ain't that the truth and, and whatever. But then I see the same photo of a German Shepherd and the same of Rotti. The reality is, it's, it's not a terrible, you know, once, once I say uh, free, I won't say, say it too loud now, but if I say it then, they're up, they can go wherever they want in the house. The house is theirs too. But if I ask them to go to bed, I've got to be able to make sure because they are prone to hyper-attachment. And they are prone to following one person. This is where a lot of other 
behavior issues start coming in. So it's just being able to say, right, and it doesn't have to be a bed on the floor for that. I once worked with a dog that had their own four poster bed. So as long as you can say, go to the bed, settle down. So it's not always on their terms. You're able to actually initiate it. Now, every single thing that you can think of, hoovering, sweeping, um, here, this is just uh, the down. cat. My Can't daughter's entered the room. The video. My and daughter's just entered. Let me move and that. See. And they've stayed relaxed on their, on their bed because somebody new. Most of the cases I work with, the moment somebody new enters in, they're up and they're all over them again. Um, next one, we've got, I asked my wife then, I said, right, I'm just taking a couple of quick photos. Go and start tickling me and make high pitch noises. Now, in the, in the past, with it, in the past, all of the dogs would have tried to gravitate towards that excitement. So they pick up on the change of excitement and they start playing with one another, but they stay on their area because they've been asked to go to, to go to that area. And if they get up, I just lead them back. We don't get frustrated. Then Wicket then has just come in from the garden. He's got a bit of a hairball. And... The hairball, right? Stitch has moved. So the level of excitement has changed. He's jumped up in the settee. Stitch wants to move. Now, what I would do there is I would... If I go back to here, oh no, that's too far. Right there, I would click and reward Lilo because she stayed on the bed. And then I would just go, Stitch, back in your bed, boy. But then I would do the same for the Pomeranian. Wicked has to do the exact same thing. And Lilo and Stitch are free roaming. And this was, Stitch is very headstrong around dogs. And all the trainer put in all the socializing. I'm very mindful of him around, particularly smaller dogs like that then. So it took me about five weeks before I really trusted him with, with a Pomeranian. So this is all part and parcel. Give the Pom time to free roam. Pom on your bed. Give the doves time to free roam. But it's all set in a structure and it is putting boundaries in place along with a lot of love and affection. And then the last one you'll see, throw a ball back and forth. So you can see Stitch is interested because he's watching the ball. So looking at that marker training again, there. As the ball, watch him looking at the ball. This is where I would click if I'm the one training him. This is some, this is two people playing tennis out in the park. I let him watch. Don't hide him. Don't look at me, look at me, look at me. Let him watch. And when he looks at the ball, that's fine. And when he looks at me there, bingo, I click and treat. And before you know it, you get to the point that he looks at the ball and he looks at you. When you go bingo, there's your reward. And you're constantly educating in that way then. So the final thing then that we look at before uh, just going through a couple of videos just to really um, reiterate what I've been talking about with regards to understanding body signals is creating red zone areas. Now, this is extremely important. For me, your front door, your back door, the, the back gate, the road, the boot of the car, these are all red zone areas in that if your dog runs through them, they can, they can get run over. It could be serious. So we have to put these boundaries in place right from day one. So what we're looking at is making sure that when I get to the door, I don't make, it, make my dog sit and wait or sit and stay or anything like that. What I do is I just simply get to the door and I just walk through and the dogs follow me like, like they would do. So as they follow me through, I shut the door and I start again. I, I say no and I bring them back. Then I open the door, I step through and they follow me. Nope, bring them back, try again. As you get better, you'll get to the point that you can just walk back and forth to the car and they may follow you to the doorway, but they won't step over. Then you've got to bring in your release marker. So if you watch here, I'll show you that I'm just recording them. There, I turn around, I walk to the van. Now I'm going to bring in dummy release markers. Bananas, apples, beds. Okay. Guys. Guys. So, same with the road. Every time I get to the road, I just walk out. And when they follow, I go, nope, and I bring them back. If they're about to want to catch them early, I can go, ah, but those are just my two that I use. But if they step out, nope, try again. And then when I step out and they don't step onto the road, click treat. Then, after... Uh, when you choose whatever you're going to say, okay, they cross the road, click treat, gradually wean the clicks out. So I appreciate there's a lot to take in. 
But now it is over to you. So we got three videos, that's all. And we're going to see here. This is where I open it up. I know there's a lot of people, so we may find that everyone's trying to talk at the same time. But if you're confident enough, please feel free to, to have a bash. Now, by the end of this webinar, the, the aim is for you to understand my philosophies, but also to really understand the body signals. So we've split the body down, head, ears, eyes, nose, mouth, body, tail. What signals are they showing? Is that dog relaxed? Is that dog giving diffusing signals? Is the dog giving cutoff signals? Then I'll tell you afterwards what the dog was doing and we'll see how we, how we go. So watch the video. Hey, dog. Okay, so is there anybody confident enough to just have, have a guess? What, what have we seen there? What, what is there anything here? <laughs> Two seconds, I'm just going to shut the door. Um, right, shut the door because I could hear my boy's Xbox upstairs. So, yeah, um, anybody got anything that, that, that they noticed? Looking. Oh, sorry, go on in. Tongue flicking. Tongue flicking, brilliant. Okay. So anything else? Anybody see anything? Anything? I don't feel you've got you've got to answer. If not, some people like to. Some people He's very unsure. Very unsure. There we are. Good. Scared. Scared. Telling them to get away. Just a warning signal to keep them away. Right. Okay. Brilliant. So that's super. Thank you for um I, I got you. I've only got four. I haven't got the gallery up, so I didn't know who, mm -hmm. who actually said that. But thank you for um for having a go so basically what you don't know about this dog is it's bitten okay. uh two people and they end up having skin grafts he bit them by running over robbing their food sandwiches and when they went to grab it off him he latched onto their hand so what you didn't see is that he was up on his owner's lap and i opened up my bum bag this was no. six, six or seven years ago and i opened up the bum bag and he clocked my my the cheese that I had, and he moved into me. So he was targeting. He was in a targeting state. But by the time I got my phone up and started recording, he has a change of heart. And we've got to be specific about it. So right from the off, we've got ears are pulled back. Uh, head has been hunched down. Eyes are averting. And then we've, we've mentioned the tongue click, which I've got to say, Tongue flicking is one that's probably one of the first times that anyone's ever picked up on a tongue flicking. So what we're going to look at first is the eyes. Every time he looks at me, he bears his teeth. So he's telling me he doesn't trust me. Stay away from me. But then um, he looks away. So he blink, blink, blinks and looks away. So just concentrate on the eyes. Looks at me. Looks away, looks at me and warns me. There's the teeth. Blink, blink, blink. Look away. Looks at me and bears his teeth. Blink, blink, blink. Look away. Hey, dog. Right. So that was the eyes. So then, from there, if um, go on, you can open the door, hun. Um, if uh, now we come back, we saw. So we saw the teeth. But what we saw with the teeth, people concentrate on the teeth. But the fact that every time he he looked at me and he bared his teeth, the fact that he went blink, 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 look away, that's what I was talking to you about diffusing. So even though he's bitten two people, he was warning me that he didn't trust me, but his head is down. You can't see his tail. He's hunching. He's made himself smaller. He doesn't want any trouble. Don't come near me. Let me move away. But I'm looking away. Look, I don't want trouble, but I'm telling you not to touch me. So that's what the eyes are showing us. Then tongue flick. So what a tongue flick means I, that bull mastiff that I showed you the photo of earlier, she used to try and grab dogs when they were entering the field. She'd make herself big, she'd zone in, and she'd start flicking her tongue in preparation. As they come in, she tried to grab. She had to wear a muzzle until they were all in, take the muzzle off. If they're staring and flicking their tongue and making themselves bigger, then it's more intense and it's part of a warning. If they flick their tongue and look away, and you may, at some point, we've all shouted at our dogs, or we've said, as I've said, like, you know, what is this or whatever? Watch your dog. He or she will go and look away. Flick the tongue. Look away. So let's have a look at the, the tongue flicking and we'll count how many there are. One. Two. 
two, three. Lay down. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Right, so nine tongue flicks that often go missed. And it's understanding what he's trying to communicate. So great, excellent. Next video. How do we feel about this one? Right. Anyone notice anything that they're confident enough to mention? The wider eyes. Wide eyes. Excellent. Anything else? Body was very stiff. Right. Okay. So stiff and body posture. So what triggered it then? Do, do we think triggered the stiff and body posture, wide eyes? The touch. The touch of the person. Brilliant. Again, thank you very much for, for giving your opinion. So right from the off. This owner came to my house again years ago. And when she came to the house, she said that her Rottweiler had bitten two of her friends and he'd welcomed them in really friendly. But when they went to say goodbye, he bit them. And I said, right, talk me through this, went to say goodbye. Well, he was lying down and they went over to smooth him and he bit them. Was, was he asleep? No, he, was, he wasn't sleeping, but he, he was relaxed. And I said, but the, the, the worrying thing for me is there wasn't a sign. I said, well, there's always a sign, but it may be ever so slight change and she said no there was no sign there was no bearing of teeth there was no growling you know there was nothing like I said yeah those are the more obvious and she was having none of it so I said right tell you what I'm going to do I'm going to wait for your dog to settle down so if we look at him there head is in neutral alignment to the body ears are relaxed eyes are closed to the point that he's sleeping he's not engaging the nose but he's asleep so he wouldn't be there's that jawline running back to below the eyes body's lying down free of tension stationary relaxed tail relaxed at the side that is a completely switched off dog. And what triggers it? Me. I step in. I'm the friend that goes to say goodbye. And the reason I love this video is because only one of the seven chains, sometimes three or four happen like that. And you, you see the head, the tail, and like we saw with the last one, and you're a bit like, right, okay. And you can step in. Now, why does like that doesn't mean you're going to get bitten. We know with this dog, it's a bite that other dogs may get up and panic and run away. The point of the matter is, the way that his eyes have opened, and he hasn't looked at me nice and calmly, he's looked directly down there. I'm over here, and he's looking directly down there with wide eyes. So why don't I get bitten? Because I stopped moving in. So then he looks to his owner to say, what's this guy up to? And watch now, watch him turn, look at me, watch the, he purposely blinks at me <clears throat> to diffuse tension between the two of us. So again, he doesn't want to bite me. Watch the blink. There. Blink, look away. Now, if I move in and I ignore that blink, it's the fact that he blinked and looked away back to his owner. If I ignore that and I move in, then yeah, he may overreact. He may be one of those and then I get bitten. But because I've seen the, white, the wide white eyes, I stop. He glances at me and blinks and looks away. And he's like, are you going to move away then? And as I move away, the further away I go, he's then able to settle back down. And if I carried on um, recording, he'd have just gone straight back to sleep because that's what he did. So sometimes only one of them change. So the final one, and then we'll check to see if there's been any questions. This I'm going to mute because this was one that was I was tagged on Facebook years ago. It's in Spanish. So you know I don't know the owners or anything, but the dog does have a go at the child, unfortunately. So we're going to watch the video first, and then I, I'll just talk you through. We won't get anyone else.
and then he runs off. Right, so to start with, I'm pretty sure everybody here would, is sitting there going, why is, are they letting that child crawl all, all over the dog? The dog is cornered and all that. So we all feel that way, but let's make it more specific about body signals because that's what we're looking at. Right, let's look at the ones that are okay then. So the tail, even though it's being held, is quite relaxed there, even though you know he's not tucking it, he's not trying to move it. Um, jawline's running back to below the eyes like we talked about, okay? He's lying down tilted, so he hasn't all of a sudden jumped up to remove himself. This is where it changes. Let's start off with the eyes. Now, well, nose, first of all. As I said earlier, that a dog is going to engage with the child as it approaches. If a dog is fast asleep, they're going to look. Now, they may start sniffing. They may snuggle into the child. They may go, okay, it's you, and then lie back down and go back to sleep. What the dog's not going to do is look at your presence and then stare into space. Now, watch the eyes. Already, the eyes are almost begging the person holding the camera to help. Now, watch looking into space, not engaging. Watch how they flicker back to the camera. There. And then the child moves slightly back, so he has a little glance, and now he looks to the side there. So the child's engaging here, and he's looking there. And then he glances and looks there and raises his head up. So he's already disengaging himself from the, uh, from the child and saying, no, thank you. Somebody moved the child. I'm feeling stressed. Looking at the camera. Please help. Please help. No. Um, and then we reach the point that the, the child moves further up and he's reached the end of his tether and he react, reacts. But for this one, I'm going to put the sound back on because I'm not going to let it go that far. Um, look at the ears. So they're alert. They're pulled back. But watch this ear here on the left-hand side. So his right ear. Listen, when the baby goes, Ugh. Watch that start twitching. It's that sensitive to the, the um, sound of the baby. You know, if my children growing up, if they made those noises, the dogs didn't even lift their head. So just, I'll unmute it. Watch that ear. <laughs> See the twitching? So they're not as obvious as some signs, but the signs were there. And if that child, so what are these? Cutoff signals. Stop. Stop doing what you're doing. Remove the child. Remove the other dog that's winding this dog up whilst it's trying to relax. It could be a, remove the cat. Whatever it is, they've moved in. These are cutoff signals saying stop. Remove that. This dog never, ever reacts. This dog thanks you because you picked up on his signals. That child never gets hurt. And unfortunately, too many people are missing out on them. So I got to play it all the way through because I'm not rubbish on computers. I'm really impressed with myself that I actually managed to make that twist around. So I'm going to make it go all the way to there. So I'm going to stop share now and I'm going to see. Okay, I've had eight, eight questions, guys. So I'll just, I'll try and see if we can go through and see how many there. are. Um, oh, there we are. So these are just, uh, there's one saying, Unsure, please back off. Okay, so that was just communicating what you thought that, uh, in the videos. Good. When teaching the settle, should we use a verbal command? Right, so with me, you may have picked up. When I brought Lilo and Stitch in then, I said, um, I told them, so on your bed. And when they went to the bed, I said, coach loud. So that to me is settle. When I first went, I never say sit. Because if I say sit, I've now given the command to sit. And when they lay down, they've gone against the sit. So all I say is bed. When they choose to sit, I'll mark and say, I like that. Then I'll, it, I'll disengage. And when you give the treat, you'll find your dog will get up because they think end of exercise. But that's where teaching them the release mark. And that's why it's so, so important. And a lot of people I work with will make the mistake of making good boy a release marker without even knowing. I'll give you an example. You, you, you go like this. So you say, uh, Scooby, sit. Scooby, come. Scooby comes over and you go, sit. And you lift up the treat. Scooby sits down. You go, good boy. And you give the treat. Scooby takes the treat, gets up and walks off. You've just taught Scooby he did the right thing. And when you said good boy, he takes the treat and walks away. So then you're walking down the street and you're going, heel, heel Scooby, heel Scooby. And then all of a sudden, Scooby starts walking to heel nicely. And you go, good boy. And then your arm's taken off because he thinks, end of exercise. I use praise. I still say good boy, good girl. I'll use excitable when I'm playing tug. If they're tracking, then I'll say good boy and I'll be tapping the side or whatever. It's a little bit different to marking, but we've got to make sure that we're specific. If I say sit, uh, they've got to stay sitting. So I say bed, when they sit, when they lay down, when they tilt, I mark all three initially. 
Then I go to say bed and I ignore the sit. I ignore the lay down. And when they tilt, I'll click and treat. Then I'll bring in settle. So I'll say on your bed, settle. And I won't click the others until they lie down and tilt. And I go, bingo, that's the one I wanted. And then gradually I just stop marking the, the settle roll. As you saw, I brought them in, cut slow, and then they just lay down and, um, and, and go to sleep. So uh, how do we tell play fighting with my dog puppy, an older dog from something cross and like more aggressive? Uh, it's very difficult without looking at a video. And this is where we go from here. You can send me videos on WhatsApp and I'll have a look at, I get loads sending me similar scenarios. But what I tend to look at is imagine, I don't know if, if you've had children, but particularly having two boys, particularly brothers, one is, um, one is 14, one is 13. So they either love each other or they hate each other. And when they start playing and then they, they're testing each other and then they're wrestling and all this sort of stuff, then you can feel when it's starting to get out of hand. And then either Angara or myself will step in, right, boys, enough. Now, if you just say boys enough, you'll find they carry on and then they carry on. But if you use boys and then you give them direction, right, get off him, move away from there. Right, get on the homework now, please. Uh, whatever, you've just given direction. Same thing here. They're allowed to play. And you're, the older dog is allowed to tell them off as well. But sometimes I even see that the, the older dog is telling them off too much. So it's following your instinct and stepping in. But remember, if the older dog is trying to be left alone and the puppy is hounding, and this dog's walking around, that one's following, 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 then it's your job to step in and remove the puppy but then let's engage with the puppy. Let's have a game of tug. Let's stop um, our puppy from hounding the older dog. And in time, then you take them out and you'll find that when you go out into a bigger space, your older dog then wants to play because she or he knows I'm way too fast for you. Um, you're not going to get near me. Then all of a sudden you've got to step in and tell your older dog to calm down. So you will, you will work it out. But um, that's something that's a bit more specific that if we can look at sending me videos, I will look at it. And I'll talk at the end where we go from here then. So uh, our doorman, Logan, is fine when we leave the house, but can't cope when we go upstairs. He will whine more until we come down. We try taking him back to his bed, but when we go up, he'll move off his bed. By us coming back down, are we reinforcing? Yes, you are. How do we practice fix shape and luring him back with him staying in bed? Great question. So first, I, as I said, climb an Everest. Don't... Um, go straight to going up to bed and don't wait uh, to be going upstairs for bedtime. Practice it regularly throughout the, throughout the day. But this is what the whole shaping thing is all about. I start off sending them to the bed. Then I've got trigger points. When I, uh, I'll, I'll, right at the base camp, it'll be moving around in the same room. So if I stand up, walk away without looking at them, use my peripheral vision, pretend to go on my phone, come back, sit down. You'll find when you sit down, they'll get up on your bed, settle. And this is what I'm saying. It's not about tough love. It's about building them up so that you can go upstairs and have a shower without them whining for you. So if you can't do it there, you won't, you won't stand a chance up there. So I go up, uh, come down. We've, we've got to the point where we're moving around here. Then I leave the room and leave it 10 seconds. And if they get up to follow me, these days you can set up an iPad. You can be looking through your phone at them. And then if you come in, walk straight past them, sit down. If, they, if they're sleeping, don't click. But if they watched you the whole way, but they didn't move, click treat. If they get up, you may need to leave a lead on for now. Lead them over. Obviously, never go upstairs and leave them with a the lead. We don't want something to happen. But the point is, you gradually increase it. And you bring in all these distractions, like such as you saw with the impulse control, with the ball, leaving the room, make yourself a cup of tea, knock, knock, knock on the door. One of you sneak out so that you don't mind standing outside for 10 minutes if you want. Because I can cope with all of these, when, unfortunately, I lost my mother-in-law uh, four years ago and we inherited a cat. And when I brought the cat in, it was completely new for my dogs. And at the time, I, I had four. And I had to get them to accept the presence of the cat. And the very first step is always, when I brought the palm, like I said, I didn't trust Stitch with Wicket. And now I've got Leia. First thing, have them both stationary. Second thing, I let the Pomeranian move around. And if I see Zeus watch, uh, Stitch watching like that, when he blinks and looks away, I'll go click treat, good. If he gets up, I'll say cut you out and I'll shut it down immediately. Because I can do all of these things, going upstairs is just another challenge. But as with anything in life, you get out of it what you put in. So you've just got to be patient. And yes, when you come down, you've got no option, he's already moved. So when he does move, you just go, no, 
and you walk in, you lead him back, settle. Never leave the room until he's at least sitting, but ideally in that scenario, I wouldn't even unless he's laying down. As soon as he lays down, don't go back, engage with him too much. You've got to disengage. I lead him back, disengage from him. And because if I go and lie down in your bed, in your bed, in your bed, he's getting the attention that he's craving. So you just lead him back, give him the minimal amount of attention as possible. As he lays down, drop the lead, walk out. And you, you just get there with perseverance. Uh, so a bed or a place is the core for leaving them, even actually leaving the house, yeah? Building up the amount of time on the bed or place, definitely. Now, I've got bed and place. Place to me is excitement. If I show you my, um, my little pom, I bring out, it's just a square, a meter square. I put that on the floor and I bring it in and I go, place. She runs to that place. What are we going to do? And I'll be like, sit, down, stand, free. And I throw a ball. It's an excitable training scenario. Bed is a safe haven. Settle down, switch off, disengage to everything. And yeah, it, it really is the core to everything I do because if, as I've said, all of the different scenarios that I work through, I can prevent all the territorial, the separation anxiety and this and this and this because I don't let them be glued to my side. So yeah, you just gradually increase the, the length of time. How do I, I'm trying to go up to see, no. Ah, there we are. It's taking me back up. I'll do it again. So it's, it's gone straight to the bottom. So I'll go back to the top for a minute. Um, right. So last one then. So we've got Luna is 11 months old. She gets very excited when I pick her up um, from my mum's. She calms down quite quick, but it is intense. I do ignore when nipping, but I don't know how to prevent. Should I get my mum to put her on the lead first? Great idea before opening the door. Yep, brilliant. So the I'm a big uh, believer in if it's not broke, don't fix it. So when I walk in and my, my dogs get up and I get that Doberman grin and the sneezing and the sneezing, I go over to them and I'm like, I a girl and I make a big fuss because I'm not dealing with separation anxiety. A lot of trainers will tell you, you have to ignore them. You have to walk straight past them. No, but if you're dealing with separation anxiety, if you're dealing with it being over the top when you get back, now it's a case of, I always ask yourself, could you walk into that house holding a toddler's hand? No, because then that's the toddler getting hurt. Right, that's where it's getting a little bit out of control. So, brilliant, yeah. If, you, if, if your mother puts a lead on, we don't want there to be a connection that the lead is, that means you're coming. So perhaps put it on, take it in the garden for the toilet or whatever, bring it back, and she just gets used to trotting around with it on so she doesn't make the connection. Then when we come to, uh, to answering the door, realistically, if the roles are reversed, I'd be saying she shouldn't even be at the door. You, you stop the excitement by stopping her from leaving a bed at that point. Then you go in and you say, right, come here. But then you've got a teacher. Now I've got a, a great video that I posted on my YouTube channel where I teach the dogs to come and rest their heads in my hand. So rather than correcting them for jumping up at you, teach them to come. And I, I was inspired by um, therapy dogs because they come and rest their head on a lap. And then um, people perhaps in residential homes, can smooth the dog and they're very calm. Instead of shouting for yeah. jumping up, teach her to come to you, rest her head in your hands, and then you've already given her something to think about to do. Then we'll go outside and now we'll have a play or something like that. But the initial thing, stay calm because this is what I need. So teach her what you want. If she does start jumping around like a mad girl, which she will initially, that's where the lead comes in. And as I've said, distract direct so my distraction at that point no sound because you're going to send a more heightened so all i do i use lead pressure but i, I also teach them lead pressure so if i put a lead on a dog i'm talking of just that much pressure uh, if i do that we put a little bit of pressure and the dog will try to move and i'll just do that and then all of a sudden they'll sit down click treat i want to teach them to go with the pressure so if they start jumping up and i pull up like that they automatically sit i relax the lead calm down okay good girl go go ah no and then I pull up like that. She does this, and then she settles down. Good girl. And you calm her down that way. So um, I, I'll, one more question, and I see that we've got uh, another three. Uh, you know, sorry, Mr. Viola's. Uh, I'll be working on some impulse control. Oh, that's just a, a thank you. What if dog is super focused on a walk and doesn't respond to markers of food? I suppose breaking the target. Yeah, exactly. That. And any dog that is completely focused on the environment is already struggling with impulse control. Therefore, 
you've got to start back from scratch. I will teach everything in the house, then the garden, then the park, then out on a walk, then I'll go to go outdoors because dogs are allowed in it. Let's practice our obedience in it. Obedience is a little bit different as well. What you'll find, I had um, a really close friend of mine now and I met her through having Dobermans and Jill passed my obedience and did basic, intermediate, advanced. And for advanced, she had to put her dog, uh, she had to put Whisper into a sit, walk away 20 meters, drop her into a down, walk away another 20 meters, recall past a ball, food, football, uh, and a tennis ball, yeah? And then mid recall, drop into emergency stop. So sort of like the, the good sits and ship award. So it was all about just trying to create a dog that was safe out and about in, in a park. Jill said to me, Colin, how come I can pass your advanced obedience and I've just let Whisper off the lead in Ponte Dewa and it's taken me two hours to catch her? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the more obedient stuff you do, the more you work with them, the more you give them scenting games and all this, it's, it's making the brain go into a, a problem uh, a problem solving state. You're building a bond, you're working together, but they're already engaged in the activity. They know, just as when I say, Barrod, are you ready? They're like, right, let's go to work, dad. And they're ready. There's a difference between working with them when they're already in a working mode and when they're in a free mode, which is why you've got to practice everything by saying free. Start off on a bed, work on the impulse control, then say free. Now drop the same socks and stuff that you just did when they were stationary and then they're going to fail. And then you start again. So you've got to teach them in a free. So when they're in working mode, they're like this. What do you want me to do? When you release them, they're like, oh, look at this lovely world. Let's go and explore. There's another dog over there. Boom. And they're gone because they're not already focused in it. So you've got to just always try to set up the environment to suit you. Any dog that is far too engaged on the walk has already got too excited, possibly putting the lead on, exiting the house. Uh, needs to curb the excitement so we need to do lead work um it needs lead working on healing stuff i've never done this before. i'm only now i'm new to it practicing teaching them to go and stand on a platform and spin around because i've always had a pack um five or six dogs now i'm down i'm well i'm back up to three now but now i'm learning different things like that so there's loads to go with it but it's definitely impulse control any dog that's too focused out on the walk and you can't lure them then, you've already lost them. But if you mark at the right time, I guarantee you, you will get the attention back. So I, I hope you enjoy, guys. I know it's gone on a little bit longer, um, and I think that's because we had more people, but I really want to thank you all again. Uh, I hope you've taken something from it, but the main thing about tonight is we all share a, a passion for dogs, first of all, and with this particular webinar, it's particularly about Dobermans, and I'm really proud that the money that's come in is going to go to a, a great cause such as Dorman Welfare. I'm really thankful to June for all the organising that, that June has done. And as I said, for giving up an hour and a half of, of your evening, that's going to go a long way to helping Dobbs in need. And so uh, I really am thankful to everybody. Now, where we go from here, there are a huge variety of options available. Uh, I The next step is usually a one-to-one. -one. I can do Zoom one-to-ones because I've got people that I work with from all over Europe. So we can do them via Zoom. I would need you to get four or five videos then and we book it in and it's only £45 pound for, a, for a Zoom consult. Uh, then you can come and do a face-to-face -face when, when you're able to travel and that's £90 pound then for a two-hour consultation. But this is all the first step. So this, you should have taken enough from here that there's, there's something that you need to, to go away and work on. But from here, the main thing is to just get in touch if you'd like to, to follow my philosophies and follow um, my sort of teachings then on where we go. And there's classes, there's re residential training, my dogs come and live with me for six weeks. That, there's loads. That, by the way, anybody that tries to sell to you residential training, it is always a last resort. And I see it offered way too often. I am full all year long with residential. And you ask anybody that I speak to, the first thing I do, I do is talk about meeting up first for consultations because it's ultimately always about teaching the owner. There's a lot to be gained from residential training, but I guarantee everybody, the moment that dog goes home, they will test you. They will do things for me that they won't do for you. So there's got to be a handover period and there's continued help. And sometimes, you know, it's had fantastic um, results because the owner has been able to maintain it. But I see all these companies charging double the amount that I'm charging. 
and certain individuals. And that's the first route. It's never the first route. Always look to educate yourself and, and find a trainer that you can get on board with and that, that you respect the philosophies and you'll go a lot further because you'll be enjoying it. Always ask yourself, is the dog having fun? Are you having fun? So thank you so much, everybody. I can see um, there's uh, there's more messages, but most of them are, are, are just thanking. And so uh, again, thank you very much. From here, if you want to get in touch, it you've got the Welsh Dog Whis Whisperer, Colin Jones. You can add me as a friend on, on Facebook. Uh, my mobile number is 07806 788 333. So you can text me. You can WhatsApp me videos. It, at the moment, I'm full for one-to-ones up to the middle of February. So we just got to get it booked in as soon as possible. But um, enjoy the rest of your evening. And hopefully I get to meet some more of you soon. And it's been lovely to see some friendly faces that I haven't seen for a while now. So take care. And uh, hopefully I'll see you in, in, uh, in the future then. Thank you, guys. Thanks very much, Colin. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.